I want to start this debate by first establishing what are the key terms in its motion, because I think this debate requires a hell ton of setup. So what exactly is happening with the South China Sea dispute? Basically, it's a dispute over territory and sovereignty over the ocean seas. Um, specifically, I think um, it's between the Paris of the Spratly's Islands, which are two island chains that are claimed in whole or in part by several different countries. So it's basically kind of like a foreign war zone, a sovereignty war zone, where China as well as other countries like I think Philippines, Malaysia and Brunei are all trying to lay claim to this extremely complex nautical area stretch. So China under status quo already claims by far I think the largest portion of the territory, which is an area in, defined by what is called a nine dash line, which stretches for hundreds of nautical miles south and east from its most, I think like from Hainan. So Beijing says it's the right, um, the right of the area goes back to century, um, of the island, where, Ch where the chains were regarded as like, I don't know, integral parts of Chinese nation, if I'm not wrong. But Malaysia and Brunei are also trying to lay claim to this territory in South China Sea because they say it falls within their economic exclusion zones, basically as defined by, I think, like the United Nations. So the conclusion to this characterization is that right now the situation regarding the South China Sea is one that is extremely stagnant. It's very difficult to take one side over the other because the kind of backing and um, justification that each country has that has sovereign that places their sovereignty over the island is one that is either one not exactly clearly defined, but two, even if they, it were clearly defined, is in direct contradiction to what the uh, another country specifically wants. Therefore, it's incredibly difficult for ASEAN as a whole to try and take a stance on this issue and try to like dictate which islands should belong where. But specifically, what does ASEAN actually do and what does ASEAN actually work? So ASEAN will argue to use as a primary goal of being non-intervention in general and actually works and it functions more like an economic block and works towards a realization of things like the region's end goal of economic integration and also views and has the ultimate vision of trying to integrate itself as a single market and production base, creating a highly competitive region with, for instance, equitable economic development and a fully integrated global economy. That is the primary goal of ASEAN. Sure, yeah, there's other pillars as well, such as the social, economic uh, and political security spheres, but we think that these are the kinds of spheres that do not take as much impact importance and much emphasis as we see the kind of economic talks and the amount of time spent in discussion, discussions in ASEAN meetings regarding the economic benefits and economic trades between countries. We think all the other kinds of pillars are equally important, but I may not receive and, may, and, and are probably less, have less emphasis than the kind of economic stretch that ASEAN stands for. But what we argue to you that the code of conduct right now is that there has, there has been held, there has been existing between ASEAN and China is actually not even that effective to begin with. The reason for that is because the code is not legally binding on China. What this means is that it creates ability for China to just continue like placing its warships within the area, within this nautical stretch of boats or of, of areas without having and without fearing direct contestation by other countries. What, is, what this means is that this code of conduct essentially what well, it's supposed to keep China's military actions in line to try and prevent them from fully intervening in this area is not effective insofar as it's not legally binding but furthermore also exists to strain current ties between ASEAN countries as well as China. Specifically, I want to look at why China, why ASEAN depends so much on China. Because we we'll argue to you that because the, of the idea that ASEAN looks to China from a strategic perspective, they look to Chinese money as a way to accelerate the economic development and bolster ASEAN connectivity. Because recognize that ASEAN itself functions as an economic bloc, it requires Chinese input and Chinese support to ensure that transnational projects work. So why are these kinds of transnational projects that, um, that already exist under status quo? We look at things for instance, like the ASEAN Highway Network, the Singapore Kuming Railway Link, and as well as the ASEAN Power Grid, they all require China's cooperation because a large amount of infrastructure of these things occur and exist on Chinese land. And it's basically the, the forefront of all the kinds of transnational ties between other countries as well as China. But we think that upholding this code of conduct, A, is like, completely against what ASEAN stands for, which I'll go on to my argument, what the role of ASEAN stand, uh, what, what the role of ASEAN actually is, but more importantly, B actually strains the kinds of, of relations between ASEAN and China. But on the first argument on what the role of ASEAN really is. So we argue to you that ASEAN leaders in general are committed to maximize opportunities for mutually beneficial regional integration. We look at things like many, they have like many, many economic plans, things like the trade goods agreement, framework agreement on services. We think that those agreements aim to facilitate like the movement of goods between China as well as other countries. We think the reason like these things can still exist is because ASEAN is recognized and seen by China not as an uh, uh, interventionist actor, unlike those of the West, but one that takes a more neutral stance and looks objectively at the economic values and economic viability of certain projects. What we argue to you is that this code of conduct is like specifically against whatever ASEAN stands for. Which move on to my second argument on how 
um, this hurts the idea of ASEAN being non-interventionist and politically neutral. We argue too that in general, as a rule of thumb, ASEAN attempts to try to be as non-interventionist as, as possible. What does this look like? It looks like, for instance, ASEAN providing humanitarian aid to Myanmar through its work plans, but without, for instance, directly referencing the Rohingya crisis that's going on right there. What this means is that ASEAN still tries to uphold all its other kinds of like, like cultural and health plans without having to interfere directly with politics because they recognize that its position requires the co-option of a large number of countries within that nation. We argue too that the COC at this point in time is a unique factor that should be removed from ASEAN's plan simply because it goes against this idea of ASEAN being non-interventionist. When ASEAN goes to China and tries to tell them that this is not something that you ought to lay claim over, which is in direct contention to what China wants, China will no longer see ASEAN as a neutral trading bloc and economic hub. This is incredibly hurt, like, 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 damaging to the idea of ASEAN as a whole. Because this also means things like the inability for ASEAN to continue transnational projects with China. Because what China would see, this, this COC is, even though it's not legally binding, is a direct threat, a direct political sphere against China's own interests and what China stands for. Recognize that at this point in time, the playing scales are extremely uneven. China needs ASEAN's cooperation more than ASEAN countries need China as a whole. What this means is that unfortunately, ASEAN really has to play the game of China as things stand right now. This looks like, for instance, ASEAN having to give up certain things. Yes, we, the trade-off in this debate is probably that we won't be making like that much of a fuss over the current ASEAN countries that lay claim to the islands, for instance, like Myanmar as well as Brunei. However, we think that this won't necessarily mean that we lose the support from these countries altogether because the economic benefits that these countries already enjoy under ASEAN's hub, under ASEAN's co-option, far outweighs that kind of like deadlock that happens right now. At the best case scenario in opposition's world, you have these countries feeling a bit sore because ASEAN no longer has this code of conduct that places China in line. But at the same time, we want to really question the ability and value that ASEAN really brings to the table in terms of the COC. Because insofar as the COC is not even legally binding in the first place, ASEAN is not really going to be very effective in trying to stop Chinese incursion in those waters anyway. So on a comparative, we'll argue to you that it's far more likely for all the other ASEAN countries that were in this sovereign dispute to still want to remain ASEAN and show ASEAN support because of the kinds of work plans that they already benefit from ASEAN's presence. And we think this far outweighs all the, the kind of the current deadlock that ASEAN won't be able to resolve. We think it's a better place for this. We don't think ASEAN should take or continue another step in this direction. We cannot be proud to stand on government. Here, here, the House thanks the Prime Minister to open the case from opening opposition. Let's get the leader of opposition. Here, here. Give me a minute and you start my time. Uh, am I audible and clear and stuff? Yep. All right, thank you very much. China is powerful and ASEAN is very small. With a Europe that is tearing itself apart and a growingly isolationist United States, we think that the strategy of ASEAN isn't to win, but is to minimize its damage. I think at the end of Prime Minister's speech, it begs the question, now what? What happens when you leave, when you make this grand grand, you know, charade of abandoning China and putting on a strong front. How does ASEAN maintain any sovereignty or any of its ter ter territory after it abandons an agreement and all channels have broken down? The first thing I want to point out is ASEAN is a coalition of several small states that individually do not have a lot of political power, but when combined have been a platform for discussion that allows it to have leverage in the international arena. We think that the ability for ASEAN to get concessions from a giant like China in the form of the agreement in 2002 is a huge milestone that we should not give up on. While it might be true that China has violated parts of the agreement, we think that a lot of this is largely in part to the 2002 agreement being outdated or there being loopholes in the code of conduct itself. We think that these are things that we can improve on. We regret that China has been continuing to assert dominance over the territory, but we think walking away from it is politically and strategically a mistake. Why? The first and most obvious is that we think that this alienates ASEAN from China and prevents further negotiation. Especially since China has a lot of influence in the region with infrastructural projects and MNCs, they are a large trading partner and have a lot of Chinese investments in ASEAN. That means that angering China will be something that is politically unstrategic for the economy of ASEAN uh, countries in ASEAN. Their response was to lie and say that currently ASEAN has a lot of leverage over China. No. China has infrastructure projects all over the world in Africa, Latin America, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. ASEAN won't be able to strong arm China in this case because if it was the case that ASEAN had significant leverage, I don't think we'd be having this debate because China wouldn't be able to bully ASEAN in the way that it currently does. But I want to note here that if it, the characterization was true that ASEAN had leverage, it actually works against them because the leverage seems to indicate to us that we could renegotiate better terms and better provisions in 2022 or even currently. More, besides the practical points, I want to talk about the principle. 
it makes ASEAN appear like an actor that's unreliable to negotiate with and does not uphold promises when you walk away from a, a, con, a, a agreement that is about to expire literally two years in the future. We think that this has effects on future negotiations and future discussions with China. And this means that ASEAN will have to attempt to rebuild trust with China if they're discussing about anything in the future, whether it be trade deals, whether it be renegotiating the code of conduct with regards to the South China Sea. Even that all teams in this accept, uh, in this uh, all teams in this debate accept that China is a geographically very close actor to ASEAN and has huge influence over the region. I think they're being antagonistic towards them, which is politically unstrategic. More importantly, besides the very blatant fact that this angers China, we don't think that leaving the code of conduct is the correct response, even if China has violated certain terms. We think that this shuts off channels of negotiation, not just in the sense that we lose goodwill with China, but we also lose a physical platform where we have the ability to have dialogues and express our interest to China. Right now, what ASEAN has that is unprecedented is the ability to communicate with an actor that is currently perceived to be one that does whatever it wants. I think that this is a huge win for ASEAN. The ability for them to literally meet us and hear our interests is something that's of paramount importance that we cannot lose. Even if it's currently symbolic, we think that we can, this platform itself, this infrastructure itself is something that we should preserve and we should maintain China's goodwill for the next two years so it can help in future negotiations 2022. Again, I think there have been a bit blip in the characterization of the code of conduct because the framework itself is important because we can point to the guidelines that currently exist in the provision and tell China that it has not fulfilled its end of the bargain. This is useful in telling the world that China has done ASEAN wrong. But when you walk away from the code of conduct and when it dissolves into nothing, something that was previously not really legally binding is now absolutely categorically not legally binding. This gives China free reign to literally act however they want. If the problem from OG was that China is right now bullying people and acting in a way that is kind of dismissive towards the code of conduct, that harm is exacerbated when you don't even have a legal framework, a paper document that outlines the correct behaviors. This means that China will be belligerent. I want to note here that if Chinese dominance and imperialism is likely, this accelerates the process in which China has dominance over ASEAN in a way that is hard for us to re-strategize or safeguard ourselves. So under this, I have two things to note. The first is that on their side of the house, China will not renegotiate the contract again. Or if they do, ASEAN will have to give a lot of more concessions to rebuild the trust with China. And this is crucial because the ability for ASEAN to survive in this part of the, of the globe, in this geographical location, is contingent on China's goodwill and the contingent on benevolence of our great god Emperor Xi Jinping. It's just a, a fact of reality that we are beholden in this scenario because of China's large military, because of their large economic influence, because of the monumental weight of Chinese politics. This is something that we have to, this is the rules of the game that we have to play by. But more importantly is that the, the, the dissolving of these guidelines is likely going to persuade Chinese politicians to act in an increased militarized way and bully countries in that region even more, causing fears to spread. Just re refer to all the internal politics of China and how they use narratives of their, their dictatorship being questioned and use it to spin to justify an increased military action within the region. Uh, within the region. And especially since um, you know, South China Sea is culturally very important to China, this this violation of the code of conduct that Chinese people perceive to be something that is culturally important to them is likely going to ignite the flames within the Chinese, uh, the Chinese political party that causes an increased bullying towards countries within the region. So again, if sovereignty was an issue on the other side of the house, they make it infinitely worse when they don't even have the bare guidelines, the bare bones. But what else is noted under this is that it creates a fog of war. This causes uncertainty because ASEAN now doesn't know when and what China will do because, as I mentioned earlier, the physical dialogue has literally fallen apart. You do not meet with China anymore once every few years to talk to them, to, to renegotiate the contracts, or to bring up certain parts of the code of conduct. This is detrimental to specific countries, countries that are more affected by the South China Sea dispute than others, countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, or Philippines that have a stake in South China Sea. So I want to point, I just want to note the class and the undercurrents of class that exists in abandoning the South China Sea. Uh, contract because it clearly hurts some countries more than others. It clearly hurts Vietnam more than it hurts Singapore. It clearly, clearly hurts Philippines more than it hurts Malaysia. So for all these reasons, that, that or the solidarity that ASEAN prides itself on there is significantly diluted on their side of the house. When it comes to China, an actor that does whatever it wants, it doesn't mean that agreements are useless. And I think this is important to note here. The discussions and meetings provide a channel to slowly get concession from China, but we clearly allow, align ourselves with China's in-group. The agreement, even if it has been violated in part by China, is a symbol, therefore, that we are still aligning ourselves with China's in-group, and this is something we ought to preserve, not just for benefits towards the South China Sea, but also economic and trading benefits and being part of the Belt World Initiative, all these things that are also important for the prosperity of ASEAN. In opening opposition, our end game is quite simple. In the worst case, what we have is a stalemate, a continuation and a prolonging of status quo, but we think that this is a necessary, necessary trade-off to make when dealing with something delicate like international relations and dealing with an actor that is belligerent as China. We think that what is important here is maintaining the current 
platform it has and maintaining the current good will that China has towards ASEAN so as to possibly cover a better future for all the ASEAN countries, not just a specific few. We think that this is something that's the most important thing to maintain in this debate. For all those reasons, I think the opening government's case is indefensible. You hear the House thanks the Leader of Opposition. To extend and conclude the case from opening government, the House now invites the Deputy Prime Minister. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Yep. All right, just give me a second, please. Before I start, I just first want to give a shout out to my family who's here on the Zoom call to support me since this is my first grand finals ever. And that's the exact reason why I will not be dismissive and aggressive in my speech. What I will do, however, is ensure that I take out opening opposition simply by their challenge of a characterization, which is the entire premise on which their case is based on. They say that in status quo, China has leverage over ASEAN because they have these particular infrastructural projects and whatnot, right? And they are the ones who are lying to you in this scenario in and of themselves. This is because right now, China is starting to close its doors towards companies. China is because they are actually having certain things like they're competing with the United States economy to actually overtake them by 2025 to become more than a 20 billion or 20 trillion dollar economy it is at that point in time when they are stopping united states companies from actually investing within a country like china what did the what does the u.s then do the u.s ensures that it goes to other places around china such as philippines such as brunei and all of these other asian countries where one labor is cheap and two manufacturing costs are something which are not very very high right and that is something which we feel is important this looks like a lot of multinational investment that is happening into these countries which means that these countries are now and asean as a whole which literally exists because it's an economic block is something that they support each other by the economic influx which is why they're able to then gain that stronghold they're able to have that leverage over china the second premise which they're in which, which deconstructs a lot of their case is that they assume that the china is something is the china is a party that absolutely likes the coc this is wrong because even if we were able to buy that characterization that china is exploitative in the nature in which in, in the way that it's done they absolutely hate being bound and restricted by a certain framework to ensure that they have these sort of things that are happening right they they are they are completely bound they, they, these frameworks also include may include at times things like stopping china from dumping sand into the south china sea to be able to mark and create islands and territories and whatnot which we think is something that is extremely problematic what does open opposition then tell you right they actually they actually tell you that china has like large infrastructural reasons that they don't actually go beyond that to say that china is greater than the asian but even if we agree that china holds some power in the uh, 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 some power over asian and of itself we think that darren tells you that these agreements are likely to be very very exploited in the nature that they are functioned in the nature that they are deliberated and we've seen this happening for far too long now where china is actually practicing things like debt trap diplomacy wherein what it does is that it ensures Sure that you are legally signing one particular document and then they try to bully you militarily such as the case of what they did with Sri Lanka in and of itself to try and get their way around right an economic agreement which was based on a loan and then to ensure that we are trying to bully you militarily which means that these other countries who also have a claim to the South China Sea who also have the sort of cultural importance to the South China Sea that China that that opening opposition wants to claim is so important to China right and by and that properly brings me to the next argument that they actually bring up that oh but you're going to ignite a flame within china and that's going to be something that's extremely problematic in itself we think that this is not true because the chinese communist party in itself does not really care about what its citizens or what its people think in and of itself right it has it has been one that does not really care about what its population is like about what its cultural ideals are like and whatnot in itself so unless and until it really burns the fire in xi jinping's heart that these particular things are happening
happening we don't think it is very very it, it, it is very very um likely that uh, uh, the asean abandoning this particular agreement is going to make sure that china acts in a very very aggressive way because rather they now can fight the real fight and this is extremely important to note dear adjudicator they can fight the real fight against the west against the us that is unnecessarily trying to take or take a claim within the south china sea within status quo right and we feel they they actually pose on to us a question that if this is not legally binding in and of itself and that, that then what would you do as these particular small countries within asean to actually try and ensure that you have some sort of leverage within the south china sea we think one alternative that we can very easily propose an opening government is to side with the us given that the united states is actually putting so much investment into us right and then he even tells you that oh but this is going to lead to a consequence of a complete war happening that is already status quo right this legal agreement mere, mere, merely means that these particular countries with china which are actually at a stalemate right now in and of itself are not are, 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 are sort of siding with the sort of chinese interest given that china is a bully given that china is exploitative in and of itself right we also think this manifest in the ways of this exploitation occurring is that your economic and trading benefits which will be traded off with these countries can act, china can actually bully these asian countries even if we agree that china is a bully that they can actually uh, Um, bully these countries into having these sort of clauses and amendments that actually don't stop China from doing the sort of things that they're doing within status quo in and of itself. So, right? do you think that this war is already happening within status quo? This particular statement just makes sure that ASEAN does not get a say within 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 this particular scenario in and of itself. China also hates the COC at this point in time, given that it widely restricts the sort of things that they can do, which means that they are also likely to be happy with this decision, even if we wanted to appease China. Right? Recognize that our case is basically a win-win situation. On even if China, on whichever characterization you buy, whether ASEAN has the greater leverage or whether China has the greater leverage, I think that is something which is then extremely important. Let's then talk about what are the few things that you should actually care in this debate when you are bringing it up. Right, the first one is that ASEAN countries, in and of themselves, are not militarily involved with each other. They have things called the ASEAN Way, which is a non-interventive policy, which is something that's extremely important in and of itself. Right, and that. Means Means that Malaysia is not going to be able to send its military to Philippines or to Brunei to actually be able to support them in laying stake within the South China Sea in and of itself, right? And we think that that is something that we must consider, which is extremely important. Which is given that these particular countries are never going to have a stake, or it's never actually feasible for them to lay stakes over the South China Sea, they would much rather just like latch on to the West or completely back off or completely abandon this particular agreement, given that the harm that this agreement has, which Darren so rightly brings. to you in and of itself because if china was the one that has infrastructural power then it is in our world where these where china will actually be happier the moment you abandon this agreement in and of itself the second premise or the second myth is that us has a large amount of influence within the south china sea and you must 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 consider that simply because this war is already happening and that takes on a lot of points coming in from opening opposition in and of itself right and the third thing that you must uh, the third thing that uh, you must consider um, in and of itself while judging this debate is that this side is more effective in being able to promote some sort of peace to promote to uh, in, in being able to promote some sort of actual change that is happening so as to not be exploited by the given framework that this code of parties actually sets out which in and of itself is something which is extremely redundant for all those reasons extremely proud to propose on opening government thank you very much Okay, here at the house thanks to the deputy prime minister to extend and conclude the case from opening opposition let's get the deputy leader of opposition okay here Yeah, I'm meeting order. Uh, can you run your meeting? Rohan, unmute yourself. Sorry, mute yourself. Thanks. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I just like to point out how funny it is that side opening government seems to think that the US is supposedly someone that we should side with. That the US is someone that supposedly has the answer. If you really think about when the last time the US intervened in ASEAN states, if you look at Cambodia and you look at Vietnam, maybe not such a good idea. But the reality is really that in the in in ASEAN, we need to really think about strategy and we need really we really need to think about practicality when it comes to strategic maneuvers. Because the reality is that we need to be honest about what ASEAN can do. Because let's not pretend that ASEAN has much bite to change China. 
The question here really is, how do we best manage China in this particular scenario? And how do we best honor our, our, our status as ASEAN in totality? But what, what you do currently is you put yourself under the whims and fancies of China. And what you do is that you appear weak because if you can't even fulfill the very negotiation or the very agreement that you stood for uh, right from the get-go, we think that's problematic. So the question is, would you bow down uh, to, the, to the whims and fancies of China, or would you bow to the US, or would you at least, uh, at least practically tell yourself, yes, we need to talk, and therefore this is one of the ways we are going to manage the interaction between the two. I have two things to talk to you about. The first is about how do we manage China, and the second is how do we improve ASEAN. The first and most important one is about how do we manage China. The first thing to acknowledge is that ASEAN is a new constructivist ideal, meaning to say that there is a cooperative bloc that often seeks to interact with one another and hope, hopefully come to a consensus as to what, uh, what we can do. We don't have a standing army. We don't have anything to really threaten China. So the idea that we can side with the US and therefore hopefully we can sing Kumbaya is just ridiculous. So we think that what in a world that there's an overarching problem with China and the fact that we have a belligerent China and the fact that we have a point of discussion means that we can continue the discourse that currently exists. Even if it means that China continues to do whatever the bad shit thing they want, we think that at least the point of discussion means that we have some point of renegotiation with them in the future, rather than no point of renegotiation. And what's worse is that you antagonize the entire Chinese, uh, the CCP in the first place. We think those things are import, uh, important to avoid. I want to note that at this point, Ochi actually doesn't have any platform to, count, to, to, to try to change the whole thing, right? They said that US is going to be the answer to their own solution. But we tell you that that's not the case. But more importantly, even if they were to say that the UN is the one that actually tells you whose territory is what, since when did anyone give a fuck about what the US has to say with regard, uh, what the UN has to say with regards to territorial disputes? We think what's worse is that oftentimes, uh, UN actually tells you that this is Malaysia or Singapore's land, but the reality is we don't really care about what, what happens on the, on, the, on the ground. And ASEAN has always been the intervention behind how we address this, kind, uh, this particular problem. We think here, here's the problem we have. Current discussions about territorial waters and territorial lands take ages, which means that they take at least 30, 40 years in order for us to fulfill this kind of uh, discussions. Like even Pedra Branca was a whole discussion for a few years. What this tells us is that we think it is likely, more, more likely than not that this discussion about COC will take place in the near, near future and the antagonization towards what China is currently doing will make it far worse for them to have any negotiating power whatsoever. OG currently tells us, and we, this is not a mischaracter mischaracterization by the way, OG tells us that China money is currently important to ASEAN. And that's what we agree with. Because all these things are imperative between the two states, between ASEAN and between China, we need to realize the strategic importance of maintaining ties and maintaining relations with China. We think that it is far worse on their side when they continue to assert China's dominance without actually providing a counter narrative as to how exactly we'll solve this. Uh, Rohan tells you that this debt threat diplomacy or that this China is the COC, but we tell you that these things will continue to happen anyway. And so what if China is the COC? We think that's a good thing because it means that the ASEAN finally at least have a leash over what, the, what China thinks and at least have, have, have some control over the narrative of how we actually seek out renegotiations or find ways to uh, resol resolve territorial disputes in the first place. Even if it means it is far longer, we think that the idea here is that China always prioritizes things such as quantity. If you break that quantity in the first place or the relationship between the two uh, institutions, what happens is that there will be much worse animosity between the two and it's far harder to rejoin that particular renegotiation power altogether. The second thing we want to talk about is how do you improve ASEAN? And that's quite important because they really didn't have anything. But first, I want to point out that I think people underplay how dumb it is and uh, that ASEAN is walking away from the thing that you work very hard for. Because let's not lie, like COC is just something that it took two minutes to, to try to figure out, right? Because it took ages for them to figure out how to therefore negotiate these things and therefore China, uh, China decided to buy into this particular argument, right? So we think the fact that you continue a dialogue with China is a mechanism for change. We can't promise you that the change will actually happen. And in fact, in worst case scenario, we think it will be a wash because China will continue doing whatever they want. But the reality is at least ASEAN has a particular stake at hand in order to figure out what exactly goes on, on in Chinese ground and what exactly the updated China is going to be like. We think all these things are particularly important. But before that, Darren. 
China already communicates with ASEAN and cooperates with ASEAN on many, many multinational projects. Why is this COC the only avenue in which ASEAN can ever have any diplomatic discourse with China? Yeah, the answer is easy. It's quite it's a domino effect, right? When you antagonize one over the other, the, the rest of the things happen and we think relationships sour the same way they do normal relationships. It's quite sad. But we think that, that those things will happen. The reality is if we continue a dialogue with China, the the eventual outcome is far better because at least we don't tell ourselves that we cannot do anything. But what's worse is that if you walk away from this COC, what happens is that you lose political legitimacy as an ASEAN institution. What do I mean by this? ASEAN historically has failed many times in terms of interventions amongst one another. They failed to try to resolve the Taiwan Rangka incident. They failed to resolve many things. So the reality here is that they are at a tooth, they are quite toothless and they have, have no ability whatsoever to figure out what's going on. The very fact that they have this particular agreement here is already a, a good thing that they should celebrate for and it's a good thing that they should work, work towards, right? We think that there's no other ways in which they can really figure out what's going on. So, at the end of this debate, what you need to take away from is that ASEAN and China are buddies and they need to make sure that they can continue working, working together in terms of ties. The moment you antagonize them and do something that they don't like, even if it means that you, you, uh, even if it means that you don't walk away from the COC, what happens is an eventual outcome that will always favor China. We think that you, ASEAN has a, power, has a part to play in the entire narrative. And if you walk away from this, you lose the power to control the narrative altogether. Thank you. Okay, here, right, the House thanks the Deputy Leader of Opposition. To begin the closing half, the House now invites the government member. Here, here. Hi, am I audible? Yep. Great. I will start my case in three. Two, one. Panel, understand that the opposition's entire case is centered around good intentions, right? But good intentions does not always necessitate cha change. When they talk about how the political legitimacy of ASEAN will go away once they say back out of this negotiation, what they are essentially trying to say is that the intention to create change or, or the intention for a positive outcome through these negotiations is enough. Despite the fact that these negotiations China and ASEAN had is unlikely to lead to any positive change, right? They come up here and say that ASEAN walking away from something that they work for, a mechanism for change itself is to be celebrated. And they concede to the extent that this change may not actually happen, but that is okay. We as closing government wish to emphasize that to the extent of change actually happening, we, the, uh, they, uh, we believe that the ASEAN must back out of these negotiations because that's the only viable option for change, right? They vastly overplay the impact of China going back on its words and the public perception thereof, right? Understand that how the history of how China has been negotiating in the past and how it transacts with other countries has always been that of oppression and that has of bad faith, right? understand that the characteristic of China to be aggressive in relation with other nations can be emphasized through trade where over and its deadly debt trap in, uh, in diplomacy where they uh, invested with exchange of sovereign land as collateral or how it deals with Tibet or Hong Kong. Hong Kong. This, this the aggression and bad faith in which how it negotiates is absolutely, it's evident from how it seemed to capitalize on this present pandemic and global standstill to increase its presence in the South China Sea, right? Ultimately, the, the Ch China with in its main, uh, in its objective of maintaining power and of aggression and negotiate from a position of power will not be intimidated by bad faith right understand that if ASEAN continues with these negotiations with China they are unlikely to get the kind of outcomes that they want right now over here prolonging status quo we argue is extremely unviable and the alternative being to rely on the West, right? The 
the West who can legitimately bear the brunt of Chinese vendetta is a far more viable alternative than than so continuing these negotiations with the threat of China inflicting some kind of harm in bad and and therefore these negotiations leading to nothing right understand that the west has a viable incentive to support these the support ASEAN because of the dead decades of trying to keep china in check economically right through economic coalitions and blocks not just the usa but also other blocks of western nations such as the eu have consistently tried to ensure that china doesn't achieve excessive monopolization and has tried to ensure that china is kept in check right understand that transacting with the west is a best is the better way to do this because any repercussions that asean or these countries must that may face is mitigated by this right now first the why is how is siding with the west better than status quo one sovereignty is maintained now china in the in its trend of um Uh, negotiating with other countries and its and its trend of acting out with other countries have consistently tried to infringe upon the sovereignty of all these nations right decision making in any of these negotiations is almost never a fair decision or is not a legitimate decision because the threat of china inflicting repercussions is always over their heads right but on in a contrast western nations largely respect autonomy in negotiations right that this is a uh, this is evident from if china if uh, these asean nations chooses to rely on the west and western nations instead it is a shift from debt trap diplomacy that china relies on that consistently seeks to infringe on the sovereign land of all its nations it negotiates with to a more balanced negotiating table where these countries can have or can hope for some of their rights being ensured right now ultimately over here um the west will ultimately uh, accept the why would the west want to negotiate with asean in the first place simply the act and the repercussions of backing out of the coc and the impact it has on the international platform would persuade the west that would um that 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 and would incentivize them to enter into negotiations with asean right the west would accept the terms of the asean because they do not want asean to continue its negotiations with china right the problem with the uh, opposition case in this present um, debate is that over a long period of time irrespective of intentions asean will always lose out on its decision making ability with any kind of negotiation with china irrespective of what context it is because the nature in which china negotiates is always that of brute force and bullying right therefore relying on not just usa but a western block of nations is far more uh, um, in uh, far more consistent and is likely to yield better results now the question of whether or not it is strategic for asean to back out of the deal now consisting uh, considering that there are just two more years left and this is something that it's tried to work understand that despite the fact that asean strived significantly and put in a lot of efforts to get this negotiation going in the first place this negotiation was not dealt with in good faith by china right understand that uh, as a consequence of this it is unviable over the next few years considering the present social so present economic and political situation across the world to prolong a negotiation with the dead end any longer and with that we're ex we're extremely proud to propose hey here at right, the house thanks the government member to conclude the case from closing government the house now invites the government whip here here uh, can all of you hear me i'm um, you're a little bit soft uh but if you can come closer to the mic it'll be fine it just uh, one
What about now? I hope it's fine. Yep. Okay. Better. Cool. I'll start in three, two, one. Panel, over the course of my speech, I'll be focusing on two questions, and that's about it, right? Like, first is, what is the outcome of these negotiations, and what is it that side opposition fully really wants from this? And second is, what will ASEAN do alternatively to handle and bear the brunt of all of the so-called damages that opposition thinks is going to happen to ASEAN, right? But, but like, just a couple of things I want to point out that uh, closing opposition talks about, right? The first thing which they say is that we can't rely on any of the Western actors because it's not in their interest to, uh, it's not in their interest to keep China in check, et cetera, right? Like that, that doesn't take into account how the West, like both US and the European Union, and le like, let's just take US also, has always been looking for opportunities to keep the Chinese empowerment in, in check. And I, over the course of my speech, I'll tell you why the outcome of these negotiations is just going to establish China as a lot more uh, as a lot more dominant uh, power in that region, which means that it's a lot more important for the West to look at. Uh, it'll be in the incentive of the West to look at situations where they can resolve this or try to reduce this uh, dominance. Right? But the other thing which they say, and we think this is uh, quite uh, unreal, is that you will you're going to have fair. Uh, negotiations over a longer period of time with China if you accept these negotiations, right? And I think the point at which opening opposition has also con conceded to the extent that sometimes these negotiations may go to a wash, that they've also accepted that China acts as an aggressor, that they've accepted that China, the Chinese government acts as a bully. What we think is more likely to happen is that over a period of time, after these negotiations are over, in the transactions that the Chinese government will have with ASEAN, it's not going to be fair. It's always going to be where Chinese government is at the front foot, which means that at no in, in those decisions that the ASEAN nations are taking in, let's say, trade agreements, etc., after these negotiations are done, they will never get the kind of benefit they truly deserve. And we think that's a particular harm to the way uh, things are going to be approaching. I'll take a POI that the but let us like specifically look at what these outcomes are from these negotiations. Right? Look, the, the, the case that opposition is suggesting is that somehow things are going to get better because the disputes are going to, uh, disputes are going to uh, solve to some, for some reason. And we think what is more likely to happen is that the, the threat of China now is entrenched after these negotiations take place. Well, what this means is, for example, over the course of these negotiations, the kind of concessions that the ASEAN nation will have to make is going to be a lot more than what the Chinese government will ever do. Right? Because we agree and we all sides agree that they're going to act in a lot more aggressive manner. They're going to use the threat of their military. They're going to use the threat of of uh, the economy to suggest that look you cannot you uh, to 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 force ASEAN nations to concede a lot over the course of these negotiations. Now the reason why this concession, the kind of transaction that takes place by the end of this negotiation, is important is because what this does is it reduces the dominance or it reduces the scope of power that ASEAN holds, uh, the kind of influence that it holds in that region. Right? The, it reduces the amount of power that it can dictate over that region because it is conceded and. And not to mention China has now come out of these negotiations to be a lot more powerful nation, a lot more, uh, a, a lot more dominant force. Which means that at the end of these, out, the outcome of these negotiations is not something that's in the strategic interest of ASEAN whatsoever. Yes, they might have worked on it, but like look at what happened over the years that they did try to work on it. Right? China consistently tried to influence upon those regions, militarize the bases, take control of the trade routes. All of those things did take place. And guess what? Like when you try to call them out, which is something opening opposition says, the symbolic value of calling them out. There was no way for any other, there's no way for ASEAN to keep them in check. Like who's gonna who's gonna keep China in check when you call them out? Like just because they backed on their word, we all all uh, we don't think that's gonna take place. But before I'm gonna take opening opposition uh, for the POI. If you look at Chinese pride with regards to Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, is this not evidence that the outcomes are or more awash, but there will be an increased military presence and a more belligerent China on your side of the house? And 
and we think that's a better way to live what is currently happening because look at what the comparative is and this will let me be clear about what's going to happen when ASEAN does back out right look the comparative is one where you are reducing the sovereignty of these nations the decision making capability of these nations over a period of time when you accept when you stick to these negotiations right which means that like the 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 countries lose out on the sovereignty if they accept to if they make the kind of concessions that uh, that take place over the course of the negotiation but what's the alternative and this is crucial right you can't just say that the west uh, west is not going to do anything or it's not going to keep anything in check perhaps there would be an increased militarized presence but that militarized presence keeps china in check right that militarized presence keep keeps uh keeps china's dominance uh, or intentions and aggressiveness in check and all uh, and also the the benefit that accrues here is that ashan is in a position to to negotiate quite well with the western nations including us right? like the 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 place from which opposition comes from is to say that the west is significantly going to cause harm to these nations look so the context is 2020 when they are an economic bloc now the way in which you use this economic bloc the power of that economic bloc in those negotiations is a lot more fairer on us uh, on, on the side when you negotiate with the west as opposed to china because china doesn't really care or the economic power they've already aggressed but the uh, but companies in us and the european union do there are already there are they are already looking to invest in like smaller avenue companies like gojek and go uh, on grab because so the point that we're trying to make is that these negotiations that take place the kind of uh, the kind of transactions that you will end up happening that you will have with the west is going to maintain your sovereignty a lot more why because the west wants to keep china in check so that's one incentive that they have and asian wants to bear the brunt of the harm that might take place whenever whenever you when you see uh, when you cede your sovereignty to china right and we think that's uh, we, we think that's a much better comparative because what this means is that asian is keeping in control of its sovereignty over a period of time after these negotiations but at the same time it's not losing out on the economic benefits that it used to gain with, with china right on the other hand it is it, it is in fact diversified the kind of economy that it has it, it is improved its relations with with another force and which means that it's a, a lot more better for them to keep china in check uh to, to at the end of this debate uh, uh, the panel you need to ask yourself you need to ask yourself what exactly should ASEAN do in this position right? should they see the sovereignty over a period of time by always accepting china chinese demands or should they stand up to them by relying on an alternative force where it is a lot more fair a transaction that will take place uh, it's going to be a lot uh, it's going to be more inclined to what the ASEAN nations want and that we think is a more viable way of ASEAN to proceed with this as opposed to just relying on uh, relying on some perhaps good intention of china extremely proud to propose here here the house thanks the government whip